Town Hall Zoom meeting. This is our 10th weekly Town Hall meeting and our last weekly Town Hall meeting. We started during the state of emergency and this week marks phase one of reopening Broward. I'm Juliette Rolak, Chair of the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance, and I'm pleased to be serving as your host. Today, we will provide updates regarding the latest information available impacting business resilience and recovery during the COVID crisis. We will share as many facts as we can and answer questions that are important to members of our business community. To everyone attending, thank you for what you are doing for your community, your companies, and your employees. I'm proud that FPL continues to support our customers in the business and general community by continuing to suspend disconnections and work with our customers on bill, extending bill payments through the end of June. Well, we have four great presenters today, Senator George Lemieux, County Administrator Bertha Henry, and experts in healthcare and hospitality. We'll be taking questions throughout the meeting. If you do have a question, please send it to us by way of the chat button at the, button at the bottom of your Zoom meeting screen, and we'll get to as many as we can. Again, just send us a chat and we'll take your questions there. Please stay on at the end, until the end if you can. We have a few questions to poll, uh, about three questions that we will share with you toward the conclusion of the event. We did that last week and got a lot of insightful information. And with that, let's get right into our meeting. We're thrilled to have our first speaker with us who has special perspective as a local leader, former Senator and the chairman of a statewide law firm, Gunster. Welcome Senator George Lemieux and thank you for your insights, information and guidance. Please do take the floor. Thank you, Juliet. Uh, hello to everyone. It's my privilege to join you today. Thankful for the Broward Alliance and all of the great work they're doing to keep our community informed and keep us working. I've been asked today to talk to you about litigation and the issues surrounding litigation with the reopening of businesses and also give a discussion concerning what might be happening in Tallahassee and in Washington, D.C. to provide some protection for businesses who may be sued due to the way they reopen. Right now, both uh, Tallahassee, although the legislature is not in session, and the United States Congress are looking at potential limitations of liability for businesses. I recently spoke with Senator Marco Rubio and he mentioned that there could be an immunity that was passed for lawsuits against businesses, but that it would be a negligent standard, uh, not pre preventing lawsuits for gross negligence. What does that mean? Negligence is the normal standard of care that we have in Florida and across the country. Uh, if you had a protection for acting negligently, uh, making a mistake, not following the standard of care, then you would be immune if the Congress or the state were to pass such legislation. But what he articulated is that there would still be liability potentially for gross negligence. And that's a subjective standard. It means falling way below the standard of care, not just making a mistake, but making uh, a, um, a reckless mistake. So that's a hard thing to discern and that would not potentially prevent a lot of lawsuits from being filed. Whatever the case is, there is no immunity now. So all of us who are running our businesses, who are welcoming customers and guests and employees back to our places of work have to be careful about how we do it. So I would briefly today like to give you seven do's and don'ts to limit your liability when reopening your business. The first is we develop a return to work plan that is reasoned, measured, and based on the appropriate governmental and industry guidance. Uh, by now, you should already have been working on your policies and procedures for reopening. If you have reopened, you should have already trained your employees on your policies. There are several standards uh, that you can use in order to craft those policies. There's the White House guidance, for opening up America. There's OSHA guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19. The Center for Disease Control has interim guidance for business and employers to plan and respond to COVID-19. And there are several others from the EEOC and other organizations. You also may be 
uh, in a particular industry like the lodging uh, industry where there is a statewide lodging association and they will provide guidance to you that can help you make your decisions. There are also are local orders. Here in Broward County, we have a local order. Miami-Dade County has a local order. Those local orders can also give you guidance. Why do these uh, guidance measures matter? Well, they are potentially gonna be evaluated as the appropriate standard of care and to the extent that you follow that standard of care. If someone files a complaint against you, you can point to your adherence to that guidance and show that you are acting reasonably. Remember that claims by workers are covered by workers' compensation. So unless the uh, employer is acting intentionally wrongfully, all of those claims go through the employment comp the workers' compensation system. However, claims by others, claims by uh, your guests, for example, or potentially other people who are working in your facility, those can be brought as a general lawsuit and that's where the standard of care is important, and that's where you following guidelines is important. The second point I'd like to make is whatever you say you're going to do in terms of your policies, you need to do it. The worst thing is to have standards that you don't follow. Uh, you, you will have a plaintiff file a case against you and point to your own standards, and if you fail to adhere to them, that will be proof and pretty compelling proof that you did not follow the standard of care. So. Uh, you need to make sure that you're following your own guidance, and guidance is important. If you make hard and fast rules, you better be able to follow them. If you make those rules recommendations, then there is going to be some more give and take on a recommendation as opposed to a hard and fast rule. So don't set up a requirement that you can't follow. Um, be very careful about that as you go forward. Three, uh, do not reject work from home requests without fully understanding the employee's circumstances. Uh, this is a whole new brave world for us. We're all trying to deal with the whole work at home scenario. And a lot of our employees have very different uh, reasons for wanting to stay at home. Health reasons, uh, providing for their children reasons, all sorts of things. And you need to be very respectful and uh, evaluate those requests from home. You should consider, even if you're not legally obligated to do, to provide work from home, uh, because we think that there are going to be a lot of lawsuits that will come for folks who don't provide that work from home opportunity. Uh, there's, uh, this is governed by the Americans for Disability Act. It's governed by other laws. Uh, you need to be very sensitive and careful in making sure that you're accommodating your employees in this challenging time. Four, uh, treat your employees uh, with a soft hand. This is a difficult time. Employees are scared to return to work. And you know, just because they're afraid, that does not mean that you should take some measure to terminate their employment. Uh, you need to be considerate of that. Remember, if you're in front of a jury, there are gonna be jurors who also were scared at the time, and they're gonna look sympathetically upon your employees. So uh, for those of us who try cases, we're very cognizant of how a jury is gonna look at these claims. So treat your employees with a soft hand. Five. Uh, do make sure you are paying people appropriately to avoid wage and hour claims. So, you know, normally people would log, you know, uh, check into work or stamp into work and stamp out, clock out of work. And now we're in this brave new world where how do you know how long people are working? And in fact, a lot of people think they're working a lot more. You got to be careful with that because they can, an employee can make a wage and hour claim saying they're not being paid for the time that they're working. Uh, so, for example, if you're going to open up your business and you're not gonna open up your break room because you think that that's a safer way to comply with the CDC and other guidelines, and your employees are eating at their desks, well, they can't be asked to do work during their lunch hour. So be careful and mindful of how much time your employees are actually putting on the clock. Six, consider whether an exculpatory clause is appropriate. What's an exculpatory clause? I went to the dentist the other day and I got a document when I signed in that said, uh, you're on notice that there's an infectious disease and we're doing the best we can, but if you get sick, it's not our fault. Uh, you can have those type of agreements, but I will tell you one, they are very disfavored under Florida law. Judges throw them out. Uh, this is not the kind of thing you want to pull off the internet. If you're going to do one of these, you need to think about it. It needs to be unambiguous and the intention has to be very clear as to what liability the person who is visiting you is waiving. So be very careful about that. Seventh and finally, check your insurance policies. Uh, a lot of folks now are trying to determine whether or not they can make a claim under their insurance policies. 
a lot of those policies disclaim liability for an infectious disease. For example, one policy that we've looked at says exclusion for loss due to virus or bacteria and states we will not pay for any loss or damage caused by or relating from any virus or bacterium or other microorganism that induces or is capable of inducing physical distress, illness, or disease. So if you've got a clause like that in your insurance policies, they're going to be very difficult to challenge. They have been challenged in the past. In fact, during Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, a lot of those policies were challenged and they found sympathetic judges and they were able to get some coverage where they otherwise thought they might not. But check your policies because you might have some relief. Uh, that's the seven do's and don'ts on bringing your employees back to work. And I look forward to the question and answer period and answering any questions that you may have. Juliet. Well, thank you, Senator. You know, in listening to the seven do's and don'ts, most of them fall under uh, a phrase that I love, and that's just do the right thing. But it was really helpful for you to provide all the resources that we have at our fingertips. And, you know, everyone should be encouraged to take advantage of those resources, which in many instances spell out for us what we need to be doing. Um, so Gunster has uh, a very unique scenario in that you have several offices throughout the state. And uh, you, as you are reopening, you're also looking at uh, complying with various different counties' orders, as well as the state's orders on reopening. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how that challenges you and what the plan is for Gunster to safely getting employees back to work? Well, thank you. Uh, we have 12 offices across the state. Some of those offices are now open. Some of them are not. We are taking a very cautious approach and opening our offices more slowly than local government ordinances would allow. So while I'm here in the office in Fort Lauderdale, no one else is. This is uh, office is not yet opened. Uh, we're going to open uh, in South Florida probably the first uh, week of June. And when we do so, we're going to open with a very limited uh, group of folks, 25%. We've got 200 lawyers around the state who've all been working uh, remotely. And thankfully, we've been able to serve our clients' needs. But we're taking it very slow and steady. We want to uh, reopen and stay open. And once we reopen, we're doing all the things a lot of businesses are considering, which is taking people's temperature when they come in, making sure people are distanced appropriately, having hand sanitizer, following all of the local rules, depending upon the jurisdiction, and making sure we're doing everything we can to, to uh, keep our employees safe. I'll also point out, Juliet, that if anyone here on the uh, program today doesn't get a chance to ask a question, they can go to our website at gunster.com forward slash COVID-19, and there's a lot of information, uh, links to the webinars we've given, a lot of uh, information about local orders and best practices in case they want to obtain some more information and answer their questions. Okay, great. Uh, you know, it sounds like Gunster is following its own do's and don'ts, right? Uh, giving flexibility to employees to continue to work from home as you phase in. You said you're starting about 25%. Um, that's actually very similar to what FPL will be doing. And, you know, really weighing in with employees on who is most comfortable in coming, it's, you know, who's most critical. So I think um, that's a great sounding plan. So, uh, you know, there are employees who are at higher risk. You know, we have no, we're aware that there's some underlying um, diseases that may cause greater risk, uh, diabetes, asthma. Uh, are, how are some of the ways that uh, your firm is addressing uh, those employees coming back? For any employee who's at high risk, either due to age or due to some other condition that they may have, uh, we're suggesting to them that they stay home and we're providing them with all of the ability to do their work at home until we really feel like, and they feel like, we're in a comfortable situation for them to come back into the office. The last thing we want is for someone to come in who feels uh, insecure because of their health condition. So we're trying to be very judicious about that. And I think one thing that all organizations should be doing is having a lot of communication, reaching out, communicating from the top, uh, communicating through their HR professionals, communicating through their business division leaders, so that the people know that these are the things we're doing to try to get people back to work and all of the accommodations that we can provide and just to give people reassurance because this is a very challenging time. 
Uh, the good news is, is that, you know, Broward County, I, I checked the uh, results today, the number of cases, you know, positive cases is going down, the new admittances to hospitalization is going down. We are doing very well in this county, but we're all watching the national news and, you know, reading the newspapers where there's a lot of fear. And we have to be very cognizant of that. Fear is a very powerful thing. So it's going to take some time for all, for all of us to get back up to speed. But we, we want to make sure that those of us who have some uh, physical vulnerabilities are uh, having the opportunity to stay at home. Well, thank you so much, Senator. And I have to tell you, we especially appreciate you coming and sharing this information on your birthday. Happy birthday to you. Thank you very much, Julia. Well, we'll now uh, move on to uh, speak someone who's been working around a proverbial clock 24 seven throughout the pandemic on behalf of all of us. Our County Administrator, Bertha Henry. Bertha, you're up. Thank you, Juliet, and happy birthday, Senator Lemieux. Um, you know, this has, been, um, this has been a really interesting couple of months and I'm sure you all um, have your own um, story to tell. And one of these days we'll, you know, we'll be able to toast to each other and talk about how we got through this. But let me start with um, where we are. So we took a second uh, major step towards opening up this week. If you um, recall, our first um, uh, effort was more in the in the realm of recreation, so people can you know get out of the house a bit, and we tried to do that as uh, as best we could in a safe manner. We opened up businesses, and I, admittedly, uh, it's much of it was a little confusing. So we're hoping that with the executive order that was issued today that we try to clear that up. And basically what the executive order um, issued today does is for all practical purposes, we're pretty much all open. All the businesses can operate under certain guidelines. We have, um, we have general guidelines and we have specific guidelines based on the type of industry or service you provide. And then it identifies those businesses which are not open. And there may be, um, they're not open because um, we have not uh, reached that threshold um, for uh, movement out of phase one. Uh, the, the governor still um, retains uh, a lot of uh, responsibility and authority to move us in certain directions. Um, also, there are, um, areas that the county um, in, in some instances in consultation um, with our municipalities and in some instances not so much with our, with our municipalities. You've been reading the paper lately. Um, there are things that we're working diligently to open. So if I might, um, if, if we look at what's not open, I think that probably tells you most, uh, um, most of what makes uh, this a little easier. Um, so, bars and nightclubs, still not open. Um, you can have some takeout or delivery of, of your certain beverages, but in general, they're not open. Concert, uh, concert houses, movie theaters, bowling alleys, and I, I, I will try to capture this in the, in the, in the context of large group gatherings, and, and those are generally speaking um, areas that the governor still retains um, authority over and they're not open. There are some uh, other areas that the county itself, um, while we're working on getting our beaches open today, they're still closed. Um, while we're working on our gyms, they're still closed. And um, there's um, uh, certain criteria that was initially proffered by the state with respect to our hotels, but um, as the governor has started to relax some of those restrictions, we're working on an EO to, to address those as well. Where the majority of my time has been spent in the last couple of days is really making sure that there are eyes on the virus in our community. As you know, um, Everybody talks about um, the numbers, and we monitor the numbers very carefully. I am in daily contact 
with the health department. And I know for many businesses, it's been a little, a little frustrating, but I would hope in the end, everybody recognizes that you want to have somebody with their eyes on this virus at all times. So um, we are uh, jointly working on a number of programs. Um, we're going to greatly step up our testing uh, capabilities. Today, the state um, still provides us with a significant amount of, of testing. We've moved away from testing that, that's for individuals that are uh, symptomatic, and now we're moving towards uh, people who just want to be tested. They want to know um, um, if they've had the virus or they are because uh, they have been in contact near someone if the virus has in any way impacted their family. So the health department and um, Broward County, are, uh, we, we design a program of what we will call pop-up testing sites. Actually, it's very difficult for many of our residents to get in a car and drive to some of the drive-through locations. So we we're putting together programs. We're going to move all throughout the county and we're going to spend several days in a certain area so anybody that want to be tested can be tested. Um, our goal um, with that is to identify as many people as we can that uh, may have come in contact with the virus so that we can quickly provide them with support. You may have uh, read recently that um, the county is looking forward to helping those individuals who are sick but don't get tested because they believe that they place them uh, when they're not working, their family is at risk. So our goal is to make sure that that individual can um, stay home um, comfortably and know that they will have support. We'll be able to assist with their FPL bills, no pun, Julie, uh, we'll be able to assist them with food. We would be able to assist them with childcare, whatever their needs are to make sure that if they're sick, they can um, isolate for um, the 14 days and know that when, when, when it's over, their family uh, won't be suffering. We're also working um, in partnership with uh, Novan University to come up with um, uh, uh, a study um, and to be able to really determine how many people in our community through antibody testing come in contact with the virus. There are a number of a variety of studies that are ongoing, but it's important for us to know just where the virus is and how many people have been impacted. So um, we're hoping to roll that out also in the next couple of weeks. Once again, our eyes on what's going on with the virus in the community. And finally, uh, we're developing an enforcement program, hopefully um, uh, in consultation um, and in, with support of our municipalities. And this is, this is really, really important. We want our community to come back. We want um, our residents to feel comfortable and feel safe, but they're only gonna do that if they feel safe. And if our businesses and or uh, the services that are being provided um, are not done in a way that make our residents and visitors comfortable, they won't partake of them. So we're putting together um, a, an enforcement program and basically all we want to do is one, number one, educate. There's, there's no real benefit from running around with a big hammer. Uh, we want to make sure that you know what the guidelines are and that you post them and you, and you work um, with your local community to make sure things remain safe. And then over time it could escalate. But we want that transparency so that um, everyone can make informed decisions about who they uh, intend to uh, spend their, their local dollars um, with. And then finally, um, our um, community um, has been wonderful uh, in many respects. When this virus um, initially took off and we asked people to 
to do what the CDC guidelines call for. And, and, and I know it sounds like a broken record where your facial covering and social distancing. And, and for the most part, we had really good compliance. That's why our numbers are down. Our numbers are down because people adhere to them. So we don't want to take our eyes off the, off the ball. Um, we will be working in concert with other uh, counties in the region so just to at least have some semblance of what would cause us to sort of dial things back if, in fact, we start to see the numbers grow in, the, in a different direction. And that's kind of it in a, a, um, in a nutshell. So, Juliette, let's go with questions. All right. Well, thank you for that. And uh, it was really a great benefit to hear firsthand about the new order that was just issued today. And thank you for that. Uh, you know, the enforcement uh, piece of that and the information you provided about working with our municipalities on enforcement um, and not using a hammer, I think is going to be really important and will be valued by our general community. Also wanted to commend you on the testing, this pop-up testing sites. And, you know, county has led uh, in testing. Walmart had its first drive through in the, you know, in Broward County. You had the first walk-in ever in Broward County. I know that's been a big focus for you and the county. Do you think there are enough COVID-19 test sites available in Broward uh, and tests for Broward and anyone who wants one? So when we say anyone that wants one, um, I, you know, I'm not in a position to say that as we speak. What I uh, am able to say is that we are um, a much better in a much better place today than we were uh, a few weeks ago. It's in clearly a few a month or so ago with the amount of tests that um, have been made available to us. So pretty much now um, you can. Um, um, we're able to create these pop-up sites and we're able to run them um, and allow people to be tested. In, a, in several of our pop-up uh, sites, I apologize, uh, we, you know, we, had, we had capability to do more and we, as we promoted it, um, you, initially a lot of people came and then it sort of waned and, and it was kind of hard to get people to come back. But um, right now I feel comfortable that um, um, we can handle the steady st stream that we are currently getting, and we are positioning ourselves to have our own stockpile of, of test kits so that we are not 100% um, dependent on the, the state. And, um, and, and I feel comfortable that those individuals that want to have a test for now can, and if we start to reach our capacity, we'll dial it back and, and make sure that we are prepared to take care of those individuals that are symptomatic. But right now it looks pretty good. Well, excellent. Uh, you know, we have to commend your pushing for more testing for Broward. Uh, you know, all the reports and experts say that that really will be key to a stronger recovery. Thank you for all that you are doing, Bertha. Uh, we appreciate you. Moving on, our next speaker is uh, one of the community's top leaders in healthcare field as CEO of one of our safety net institutions, Memorial Healthcare System. We're so glad to have him join us today, Aurelio Fernandez. Aurelio, welcome. Thank you, Juliet. And I will try to give the audience an update of everything that's going on within the healthcare field in Broward County. I, I have to agree with the Senator that the numbers in Broward County are extremely positive when you compare them to other parts of the state, especially our neighbors to the South. If you consider that 55% of all the positive tests have come out of Dave Broward and Palm Beach, even when we make up about 32% of the population in the state. So this has been a hot area where the governor has spent a lot of time and energy with the Agency for Healthcare Administration to make sure that the community is safe. To Bertha's point, I think uh, abiding by the guidance that is set forth in how do we keep, keep uh, the, um, the space, um, the, what they call it now is not social distance, but physical distance accordingly is extremely important. 
because we need to maintain those physical distances and abide by them and not think that it's over with. This is going to be with us for a long time. I would like to comment on the, everyone to know that hospitals have not closed since the inception. What we had done originally, the governor, uh, through executive order, uh, did not allow us to do elective surgeries and elective procedures. It was only emergency uh, cases. However, last week, that executive order was lifted, and now hospitals are beginning to do elective uh, procedures, whether it be interventional cardiology, rehab, imaging, surgeries. Uh, we have, as an organization, gradually opened up um, all of our services. But I do want to convey the message that all hospitals, not just Memorial, hospitals are safe to uh, go to. Do not avoid a 911. We have seen an increase of uh, death, death on arrival, a DOA they're called where folks wait too long to call 911. If you feel that you need emergency care, uh, the consumer, the, the community at large should be calling in 911 so that we care uh, for whatever needs they might have. The other thing that has come out throughout this whole process is the collaboration between all the hospitals. I can tell you that all the hospitals in Broward County have, are working together to make sure that there are ample beds, we measure every one of our positive COVID uh, census, uh, how many are, are PUI, uh, which is pending the results. We measure how many ICU or critical care patients and how many patients are on vents. So that gives us all a comfort level that there is adequate capacity to care for the community at large. To address the issue of testing, uh, everyone should know that Broward County, the governor, um, assigned C.B. Smith Park as the first drive-through site uh, for COVID testing. And to date, we have done over 31,000 tests uh, through drive-through. And two weeks ago, uh, we opened it up to the public at large. If you were 18 years of age, of age or older, um, the only thing you needed was a, an appointment. Uh, one of the, the reasons that we have been able to process so many uh, uh, residents is the fact that we automated the registration process. So that has taken us from an average in the first couple of weeks of three hours plus to go through the testing process to less than 30 minutes. So that throughput has contributed to the increased number of uh, testing. Now this week we started for pediatrics even below 18 years of age. So any age can with the appropriate scheduling can go and have their test done. Uh, as far as capacity goes, to what Bertha was relating to, there's enough capacity um, in Broward County to care for anyone who wants to be tested. As a matter of fact, our capacity at C.B. Smith Park is 900 a day, and we have seen that drop to about 500 plus a day, which means that if it's happening at C.B. Smith Park, it's happening at other sites. Just this week, Miramar opened a test site uh, on the east side of town for those who do not have the ability to drive to walk through the, um, the um, go and have their, their COVID testing. But we're also seeing a, a low number of positive cases. We're running about less than 5% in the county when other parts in the state are running 9, 9%, 8 to 9% positive testing. And I do believe that it's adherence to the guidelines set forth uh, in our facilities. I can assure you that there is enough protective equipment to prevent our employees to get um, infected by the, uh, by the virus. We are, I can tell you here today, we do not have any employees who are hospitalized. Uh, the safe that the dollars that have been spent, and I have to give kudos to our board of commissioners where they opened the checkbook and said, whatever it takes to keep the community safe, you do it. And we were the first hospital to secure uh, clinical trials through Gilead on their remdesivine year. And we have saved life using that medication. We have seen a lot of patients walk out of the facility. Now, most recently through an emergency order, uh, we were able to secure to treat another 25 patients that do not necessarily have to go through a clinical trial as long as they meet the criteria and an infectious disease physician um, uh, 
deems it appropriately. Most of, some of you must have seen on the news that we were not able to provide this uh, drug to someone who was not at regional hospital, was at West. That was because we were adhering to a strict guidelines set forth, uh, not by us, but by Gilead and the folks who authorized clinical trials. But today, anyone who goes to the Memorial Healthcare System can have access to that drug as long as they meet the criteria. There is a decline in the slope of um, positive uh, cases, definitely in Broward County. I cannot say the same in other parts of the state, but in Broward County, we continue to do a good job in not only testing, increasing testing, but also having the repeat testing. For example, all uh, first responders should be retested and we do retest them every two weeks and they are given priorities. After all, they're the ones that respond to all the calls. The other partnership that has evolved through this process is the oversight over the nursing home situation. Ever since the inception of this uh, pandemic, we keep track of every patient that comes from a nursing home. And if we see a pattern that there's uh, two, three patients coming from a particular nursing home, we deploy our personnel to go out and do an evaluation of the environment um, and make sure that they're compliant. Uh, don't forget that these nursing homes, especially the small ones, do not have the resources, whether it be financially or personnel, to do a comprehensive uh, job in identifying a lot of these potential uh, positive patients. So we have uh, not only once, but on several occasions, uh, visited the nursing home, taught them, even provided them with PPEs because they didn't have access to PPEs uh, at the time. Um, that collaboration is something that is unique. Uh, it's happening more prevalent here in Broward County, but I can tell you that it's also uh, conversations we have with the Secretary of the Agency for Healthcare Administration, um, Secretary Mayhew, where we provide input on every patient who's admitted. I can share with this with you that in the 30-day the period between April 15th and May 15th, we, uh, as a healthcare system, uh, admitted 66 patients that came from nursing homes. We have identified over a five mile radius, every one of the hospitals, so just Memorial, for Broward Health, Cleveland Clinic, Holy Cross, HCA facilities, everyone has identified within a five mile radius what uh, nursing homes reside. And we take responsibility for whoever falls within that five mile radius. And I believe that that is um, one of the reasons, again, that we have not seen a spread uh, of nursing home uh, positive patients. I can tell you that we just tested all, all of our residents yesterday from our nursing, from our nursing home and there were zero uh, patients with positive COVID. So it's a constant um, effort by everyone involved in making sure that they keep, uh, we abide by the guidelines. We have no visitors allowed still in our hospital. There has been no visitors to our nursing home in two and a half months. I know it's difficult, but it is something that we have to do to maintain the, um, the number of uh, positives uh, down. The other thing we're, gonna, we're working on right now is we're approaching hurricane season. And not only do we have to be ready for hurricane season, like, like we always are, but now you have the issue with the restrictive physical plant. Uh, prior, we had borders, we had folks with respiratory issues, expecting mothers, how do you address these individuals when you're in an environment where the physical plan is restrictive? So we still have a lot of challenges ahead of us, but I can assure you that the, um, definitely the Memorial Healthcare System is here and, get, and ready for providing the level of care necessary to maintain this virus from spreading. Aurelia, you've brought us a lot of really positive news, right? Uh, you know, first of all, kudos to what you're doing with the nursing homes. You know, Broad was really challenged with having some of the higher numbers in the state of positive cases and deaths. So that's tremendous. Um, also, more importantly, that um, our, uh, we have declining positive tests. Our testing capacity is solid and treatment outcomes are improving. Uh, so with all of that, uh, with the county reopening, is it 
possible or what concerns, if any, do you have about seeing a spike in new cases in the next uh, month? Absolutely, Juliet. That's a concern we all have. I, I can, I, I can speak uh, to this that there's enough capacity in all of the hospitals in Broward County to handle the spike. We have adequate vents. We just don't want to see the spike. But right. we, as human nature, we're going to go out and and test our physical space as to whether or not, um, you know, for example, if you go to any of our hospitals in the elevators, you you can only fit two individuals and they have to be six feet apart. And there is a uh, de decal on the floor that tells you where you have to stand. You have a lot of decals everywhere. We have plexiglass. We test everyone before they come into the facilities. Uh, there is no question we are projecting a spike. To what extent, I do not know. But uh, for example, in Palm Beach, we were looking at the numbers who opened two weeks ago. Uh, I'm not saying it's due to the opening of uh, Palm Beach, but um, the, there was a, a slight spike and the average age for those who were positive, it went up from 49 years of age to 51 years of age. And you got to keep in mind that 83% of all mortality with the COVID is people are over 65 years of age. Uh, you can't discount the fact that you're young and you're not going to have a, a difficult time, but it definitely impacts the elderly population more so. So we just need to be careful. And Bertha continue to push to the community and our business community that uh, stay within the guidelines. Well, thank you, Aurelia, for all that you're doing. And uh, I think that was a good reminder for us going into Memorial Day weekend, right? Thank so you. thank you for all that you're offering and all that you're doing. So moving along, our last speaker has been a leader in restaurant reopening statewide. Tim Petrillo is the CEO of the Restaurant People, which includes restaurants such as YOLO and Java and Jam, both of which I've been to. With restaurants reopening this week, they are on our minds and we are so excited to support all our local favorites. Tim, let us know what's going on in your world. Well, thank you, Juliet. Yeah, as, uh, as we know, restaurants were, open, uh, or were able to open this week, uh, and we begin to open our restaurants today. Uh, we took the time to retrain our staff and this new COVID environment and certify them uh, with the safety, new safety protocols we have in place. Uh, what you can expect from rest the restaurant people and other restaurants um, in regards to dining out, there will be 50% capacity. Uh, inside on the interior space and there will be outdoor dining allowed with six feet of separation. Um, bars will be remaining closed. Uh, weight areas will have decals on the floor to make sure people know where to queue up for their uh, to the greeter stand and where to wait when they're waiting for a dining table. Hopefully there will be weights for restaurants. Um, in regards to sanitation and cleanliness, uh, we engaged a sanit uh, safety and sanitation on COVID to come in and certify our staff so they understand what needs to be done each and every day. Uh, each night we will be doing a deep cleaning of the restaurant and with COVID uh, chemicals, a, a, chemical, a chemical called Prevent X 24 seven, which is a chemical agent that uh, kills viruses and germs on contact on all the surfaces. Um, we will have sanitation stations set up through, throughout the restaurant for both the guests and team members to use. Uh, we, will be, we will be delivering service to our guests with digital menus or one-time use one -time use paper menus uh, that will be disposed of after each use. Uh, full sanitation protocols are in place once a guest has left the table to make sure the next dining guest is, is free of any, any type of uh, germs and, and COVID. And our table settings will be, there will be no table settings as we move forward. And anytime somebody wants condiments, we will provide them upon guest request and there'll be single use condiments moving forward. In regard to our employees, uh, we're taking this very serious. We have a, at each pre-service shift, we will take their temperature. Uh, they will be a health log every day. There's a questionnaire that is, is uh, geared towards any symptoms of COVID to make sure that our employees are free of any symptoms. And if they are, if, if they do have a symptom, we will send them to go get tested. And then they will be, they will be allowed back once we 
receive that cleared test. Um, all, of our, all of our team members will be wearing gloves and anybody handling food or food prepar preparation will, will be, everyone will be wearing masks and, and people wearing uh, gloves for food handling and food preparation. You know, like someone said on the call, it's really about making sure everyone feels very safe in our environments. And we understand that that is top of mind with everyone. And we, we have to provide the highest level of sanitation that we ever have. And we will, we will do that. And I think that that is, it's our job to make sure our guests feel safe. So they want to come back. Um, and that's what we're, we're doing for our restaurants. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, you know, I, I think it's tremendous that you are going to the extent of uh, making sure you're following all those measures and we know and uh, value that our restaurants are doing that. Uh, we, it's something that we all like to do, go out to dine and be with friends and family. Uh, so your restaurants just started to reopen this week. Yes. Uh, have you seen patrons wearing masks? Are you having any issues at all with people complying? Uh, and your, you know, yeah, your so, staff so feel about. I would say that um, it's 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 about twenty percent of people are wearing masks. Okay, and our biggest concern, my biggest concern, is not so much uh, the enforcement of our team members and our staff. It's the how people interact with each other, and there, everyone needs to be responsible. And the unfortunate thing is, once people start ha having a couple drinks the defenses tend to go down a little bit and they become more engaged with you, with each other. So, so we are, we are positioning team members around the, the bar areas and waiting areas to make sure that people are, are social distancing properly. Uh, that, that's the biggest concern. I, I've been, uh, last week I've been, went up to Palm Beach County and was on Atlantic Avenue and things like that, just to kind of see how those stores opened up and, and the level of uh, social distancing and things like that. And uh, it was concerning, I'll be honest, it was concerning. And what we're seeing right now is there's been a, there, there's what I call two camps, the camps that don't feel that it's a big issue and they're just gonna go out. And there's the camps that are highly, highly concerned. Uh, and we need to, everyone needs to take responsibility, make sure they social distance properly so we do not see a recurring spike and things like that. Because the worst thing for our business, uh, and for most businesses, but especially the restaurant businesses, once we start this engine up, to shut it down again would be devastating. And the other challenge, of course, in the service industry is the customer is always right, right? That's correct. And, so, you know, it, 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 and to be fair, it's hard to eat and drink with a mask on, right? Mm -hmm. so, so when people come in, some do come in, but typically once they're at the table, they take their mask off. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I think it's probably a good idea to uh, open that question up to the rest of the presenters on this whole enforcement piece, you know, the practicality of it or how it's best accomplished. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that, either in their own internal um, business uh, company or, um, you know, as to our customers. Anyone have any thoughts on that? Yeah, we're all stumped. It's a, it's a really challenging, really challenging dynamic. You know, all it takes is one bad actor, but I do believe, as um, I think Bertha said earlier, for the most part, most people really are uh, trying to adhere to uh, the guidelines and keeping themselves and others safe. All right, so uh, we do have some time for a few more questions. And uh, one of the questions that, uh, was previously being uh, asked is, um, I think of, of Bertha, if we could direct this to you. Um, one of uh, the questions that was asked actually was, was um, you know, if, if there are any, uh, is there any feedback that our community has, uh, who, is there a number or what channels should staff and community use for sharing feedback to your, uh, to the county? 311. Um, we, we utilize that for a variety of um, 
customer contact is like our uh, customer relations um, management system. So that would be the the best place to register, and they they know what to do with the with the inquiries once they get them. Thank you. And is that uh, available fairly much twenty four seven, or is there how is that operated? Yes. Yeah, so there is a, you have physical you have someone there physically answering calls from eight to six, and then after that you you're able to leave a message. You can actually get uh, provide information via email, so it's 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 pretty um, robust in that way. And um, there, our goal is to respond to those inquiries um, as they come in. Okay, thank you. Um, another uh, question that actually, uh, with regard to the county, is um, and it's interesting to me too. Going into uh, upcoming storm season. Uh, are there any concerns in managing of uh, emergency, a hurricane emergency while we have a pandemic? Any special precautions being taken there? Uh, absolutely. Um, that's, that is one of the major concerns that we have. And we have been, uh, at this point, we're trying to get um, some additional guidance from FEMA as it relates to non-congregate sheltering and, and then reimbursements related to that. But outside of that, it's just going to be more um, for those vulnerable populations, spacing them out. CDC has some guidance um, with respect to that. Um, so we'll use that as much as we can. Um, we have uh, certain of our shelters uh, take care of people that um, um, have um, different types of issues. You have people that, that want to be with their pets and you have um, people who just they're in and when the storm is over they're out and then there are people we take care of for quite some time, particularly if they're, they don't have power. So we're, we're working through all of that. The biggest challenge is making sure that we have sufficient facilities to spread people out and for us to have a better idea of um, the, the persons that are coming into the shelter that were able to take their temperature and things like that. So we can avoid put, placing other uh, individuals at risk if we can. Well, that's great to hear. You know, part of uh, my role is emergency management. And we've been kind of working with the EOCs throughout the state. And I say this unequivocally, uh, Broward EOC has been the most prepared. I mean, you ask them a question, they have already contemplated it and done virtual train meetings. Uh, it's really been tremendous. So kudos to Thank that. Thank you. Well, uh, we have time for uh, one more question and then we will uh, be concluding. Uh, Tim, uh, as uh, we're moving forward and I know it's kind of early, uh, any sense of what the future holds for the restaurant industry? Do you think uh, there will be a lot more, um, you know, using tablets to order, you know, not having as many employees? What any uh, forecasts on that? Yeah, I, I do. I think I think that I do think there's going to be significant changes that are, are through the restaurant business. Uh, yeah, obviously the, the menu and the way we uh, people are ordering. I think that's going to be upgraded. Obviously payment systems, touchless payment systems. Um, you know, the, the challenge that the restaurant industry faces is that every restaurant is built to be social, okay? And, and, and booths and layouts of restaurants and, and lines are manufacturing lines where they're right next to each other. So I think in the, in the uh, coming months, a lot of those things are gonna be changed. There'll be partitions through booths, uh, between booths and things like that. Uh, so, it, it's so fluid right now. It's it's changing every day, and you know, hopefully in 18 months to two years, when we have some solutions to this virus, it'll it'll be back to some sort of normalcy. But until then, we are we are going to try to do everything we can to make sure people feel safe in our environment. Well, we appreciate you. Thank well, you. thank you. Uh, that wraps up our present presentations. I would like to say thank you on behalf of the Alliance for all of you participating today. We've gotten a lot of information and a lot of positive news. This has really probably been one of the most positive uh, uh, 
town halls we've had in terms of uh, out forecasts and what's uh, going on now. So with that, uh, I wanna say, please everyone stay healthy and safe. And we will now pass this on to our uh, fearless leader, Bob Smundell, the president and CEO of the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance. Bob? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, and I agree, this has been a very uh, up upbeat uh, town hall. Um, I really want to thank our first responders as well, the folks that work at Rilio and, and your team and our, our folks on the front line with law enforcement and, and EMS and fire. Um, I know the county and our healthcare professionals are, are pushing to expand testing for these folks that uh, have a higher risk of, uh, of being exposed to the virus. So um, folks working in nursing homes and on the front line can get tested more frequently because they, uh, they literally are exposed or could be exposed more often. Um, and I think that's a, a huge push in the right direction. Um, you know, we, uh, we talked a lot about uh, this, you know, preparing for the new normal. And I think Tim touched on it a lot. Um, you know, a lot of the, the things that we talk about with restaurants um, are going to cost uh, additional investment. And when you look at an industry that's been, you know, ex extremely impacted by this whole uh, shutdown, um, we're asking a lot of those small business owners to invest in new technology. Um, and new ways to protect uh, patrons. Um, so it's, um, you know, we hope that we can you know, help by uh, be, being good customers. I think uh, if you looked, uh, if, if you listen to what, you know, Senator Lemieux, Bertha, Aurelio, and, and Tim have said, it really goes back to following the guidelines, using common sense. You know, we've got to reinforce personal responsibility. And that's really about neighbors helping neighbors. And to Tim's point, um, you know, Folks, some folks feel more threatened by this virus than others, um, but we all need to wear a face mask when you go into a restaurant and just be thoughtful of the other people that are around us. Um, I've seen South Florida respond to hurricanes and, and we've come out of, of several uh, disasters like that. You know, we can do this, we can pull together. Um, it's gonna take, uh, you know, a lot of thoughtful uh, planning as, as patrons when we go out into the community. But the last thing that we want is to see a spike in transmissions of the virus or hospitalizations. Um, you know, as, as frequently said, you know, that would be a death knell for a lot of our small businesses that are just getting on the path to reopening. Um, but the trends look really good for Broward County. Um, it says a lot about our community and the fact that we are following the guidelines. Um, I've been out and uh, I'm happy to see uh, the patrons that are using face masks. Um, I think, uh, it's got to be about personal responsibility, though. We can't depend on law enforcement or code enforcement to follow these rules. Um, the, the couple hundred folks that are on this call, I mean, as, as leaders in our community, um, we've got to step up when we see someone that's not following the guidelines to say, hey, you know, you know, think about the people that are around you and, uh, and step back or, or put your face mask back on. Um, doesn't have to be confrontational. Um, but just in the spirit of being uh, good neighbors and, and taking care of each other, um, I think we'll carry the day and that's what we've got to focus on. Um, we've got to make sure that we keep this virus suppressed. Um, I just got a reminder, we are launching a poll. I should have started with that. Um, so Maggie, if you could bring up the poll. We just have a couple questions. We, uh, we like to ask our folks, we did this last week, um, just to get a general feel of how people are looking at uh, this recovery process and how they're going to be handling themselves as they uh, they look to uh, you know the rest of May and starting in June um, and how people will be uh, going out. So if you can take a minute and answer these three uh, easy questions, um, I'll wrap up as the uh, the polls up. Um, but uh, I want to thank the Alliance team. This is our tenth town hall. Um, I had no idea two and a half months ago when we started this that we'd be doing so many of these. Um, we hope that the content's been valuable. Um, we have a lot of great people on the call. Um, and several of you I talked to during the week and you referenced the call from the previous week and that you got some valuable information. Um, so I hope that the effort that the team has put into putting these on has been, uh, been beneficial to you. Um, depending on how things go over the next couple of weeks, uh, if there's a need for additional town halls, we will definitely uh, reconvene them uh, maybe on a monthly or every couple of weeks. Um, but let's hope that we're on the, uh, the progression to get through the next 14 days, continue to see good results, um, and see uh, us move into the next phase where uh, more of the guidelines are, uh, are lessened and uh, the restrictions are reduced, um, and we can see all of our businesses um, come back online. 
Um, but understand that uh, there's going to be an investment on the business side, and we want to make sure that uh, the investment we're asking small businesses to make uh, can make sense for them as well. So as patrons, we need to do our part um, to follow the guidelines. Um, thank you all. Um, Juliet, you've been an awesome uh, board chair. I, you had no idea what you were signing on for when you uh, became chair last October, um, but you have been uh, phenomenal, and I think you've got a future on the small screen. So uh, uh, again, thanks again for all your work, and I'll turn it back over to you. And I think we can make sure we get these uh, poll results out to uh, all the participants on the call as well. So uh, Maggie, thank you for doing that. And uh, again, thanks everyone for participating today. Thank you. Bye everyone.